Diet is necessary, but not sufficient. Knowing how to deal with emotional stress is necessary, but not sufficient. Identifying and avoiding the toxicants that are causing you a problem are necessary, but not sufficient. Rebalancing your hormones, fixing your gut, you know, getting rid of the toxins is necessary, but not sufficient. It becomes sufficient when you do all these things all the time. So deeper healing is not just helping me figure out what's wrong with you, but it's also something that you can take and use as a paradigm for the rest of your life. And how do I stay healthy? Dr. Bauerschmidt, we're so excited to have you here and joining us on Don't Take the Pill podcast. Um, yeah, just humbled for your service to patients and what you do and want to dig a little bit deeper into exactly what you do. And so we really talk about integrative medicine as the marriage of kind of living in a Western world, but wanting to look at the holistic patient. What is that? What is that title or what does that mean to you? I guess, what does your practice do when you're looking at a patient? Well, <laughs> that's, that's such a broad range, Jess, because you know, you're right. Integrative medicine kind of uh, subsumes the category of you take some of the good stuff out of Western medicine. Sometimes you need the big boy medication. But yeah. you shouldn't need it forever, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you need the chiropractic manipulations to help get your spine in alignment. Sometimes you need the Reiki to just help with the energy. Some, and that's all the integrative component. I do what I am coming to like the term is biologic medicine. And, and that is let's, let's get to the source of what is wrong with, the, with our individual biology that's causing the problem. You know, we are trained as physicians to listen to a constellation of symptoms from our patients. And from that constellation of symptoms, we give them a diagnosis. That diagnosis helps them feel better because they've got a name for what hurts them. You know, it's, it's always, you know, e even if you can name a fear, the fear has less quality to it, has more, less fearful quality to it because you, at least you know you've got something tangible you can hang on to that says, oh, this is what's wrong. Totally. The mystery is gone at that yeah, point. The mystery is gone. I've got a name for it. I, I know what it is. I can Google it. <laughs> I can Google it. <laughs> and then it makes the guy sitting in this guy or girl sitting in this chair feel better because we now have a checklist of medications that we can give them to help obviate their symptoms, which is really good for, you know, temporary improvement, but more so for the profitability aspect of the pharmaceutical companies that are making it. Um, but what we need to do, what we need to change, and what we need to have more physicians doing is asking, why do I have that symptom? What is underlying my, my process that's giving me the symptoms? And that comes down to biology. So when you say, um, I, I was reading a lot on allopathic medicine, and that's kind of the point or the definition, right? It's like mm -hmm. drugs have opposite effects to the symptoms. And so yep. we're going to pair those together. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is from a, a biology level, we need to say what's going on in the body, fix that at a deeper root cause, right? Right, right. And then we're not going to even look into drugs as first line, second line, third line, maybe ever. Well, exactly. Well, and like I said, sometimes you need the big boy medication for short term basis to help pull you out of the hole. I probably haven't written more than a dozen prescriptions for things that aren't compounded for other than compounded hormones in the past few years. But you mentioned the deeper and that's, you know, deeper healing came about as, as a result of, I, I had a, heard a couple of, well, lecture and read a paper, lecture from Dr. Tom Levy. Uh, he is a cardiologist and he did a lot of, does a lot of work with vitamin C and has done a lot of work with Ron Hunting Hockey at the Reardon Clinic and, um, but at any rate, brilliant guy. And he, he was doing a lecture on, uh, at the, uh, Reardon Cancer Symposium one year about if you're not an oxidizing agent, then you're a reducing agent. And the reducing agents donate an electron and oxidizing agents need an electron. And that's how all our biochemistry works. And that's what you need to, you know, fix. Yeah. I went interesting. And then, uh, there was a paper by, uh, Stephen Genoas, Dr. Stephen Genoas. He's, he's on the faculty. I believe it's the University of Calgary. In Alberta, and he was talking about there's lots of ways for us to be sick, but not that many ways for us to get sick. Hmm. And but then he went down and listed like eight different ways for us to to be sick, and then many of those had some subcategories. I went, this is way too complicated. We gotta we gotta tighten this up a little bit, yeah, so people can understand it. Especially in your line of work, right? You're talking to people who don't have the training that you might have, and so to yeah. explain that on yeah. a very Low level, I would say, 
Yeah. Right. And then make it palatable and believe not believable, but for people just so understandable. It's just like, what's going on with my body? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, and, and really it, it just dawned on me and it goes back to basic chemistry and basic biochemistry that our reducing agents can donate an electron. And we also call those antioxidants or nutrients. Oxidizing agents need an electron. We also call those free radicals or toxins. Mm-hmm. In the exchange of that electron, that's what moves all our biochemical machinery through the Krebs cycle and through oxidative phosphorylation. It's this electron transfer mechanism that, that moves all our biochemical machinery in the right direction. We get into trouble when we have too many oxidizing agents for the number of reducing agents. That's called oxidative stress. Okay. Oxidative stress equals inflammation. Inflammation is the bottom root cause of all our current problems. I've heard somebody break it down before that says it's not necessarily illness or health, it's inflammation. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that is such a root cause of whether we look at it as autoimmunity or um, immunocompromised or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, what happens is we don't have enough reducing agents coming into the system or if we have too much demand on the oxidative side. That's where deep came in for deeper healing. The four reasons that we get into trouble with our oxidative stress is diet, because our diet is the only way that we provide the antioxidants or the reducing agents to donate the electron to our biochemistry on the oxidative side. You talked about nutrients, right? Nutrients. Nutrients on this side. Yeah. So we got nutrients over here. And then over here on the oxidative side, we have emotions, environment, and physical. Why are these important? Well, emotions, if we are constantly in stress, we're in fight or flight mode. That fight or flight mode totally changes our, our energy demands in, in, in our system. And we're in this and, and we're putting, you know, things that will help us survive for the next few minutes, our 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 heart rate, our blood pressure, our uh, sugar levels available to our muscles, those all go, and things like our immune system and our, you know, our healing, because we're not worried about healing, we're worried about getting wounded. Yeah. Our endocrine system, everything goes on the back burner, and we have this increased oxidative stress because of the demand, increased demand for energy, simply because we don't respond to stress properly. That's the emotional part. Environmental toxins. Oh, my God. <laughs> there are 112,000, according to Lancet a few years ago, 112,000 different chemicals currently in production in the world. 5,000 of them are in heavy production, which means there are tens to hundreds of tons of them being made every year. The bottom line is for every man, woman, and child in this country, there are 250 pounds of chemicals being manufactured or imported on a daily basis for everybody. You're looking at what kind of extreme stress is that placing on and they are all oxidative and we haven't even mentioned heavy metals from coal-fired power plants and all the forest fires in california (laughs) so when you talk about deeper healing and i know your clinic i loved the deeper healing for a life well lived right as your goal or your mission Mm -hmm. statement for your patients but when you get into that environmental e for the deep i'm curious how you would even talk to someone sitting in your patient room and say, hey, you can limit this, but you can't avoid this. There's got to be a side where the body's resilience takes over, but we can support it. Is that my, I guess my question is, how do you provide hope to patients when you can give these facts and we know that we just kind of walk around and exist in a chemical Mm -hmm. pool Mm -hmm. day by day? Yeah, chemical cesspool. Before yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the answer is, you know, you, you do your best for avoidance. And there are things you can do to protect yourself. Like you get rid of the Teflon skillets. You get you don't sleep on a memory foam mattress because that's like sleeping on a gas station. You know, you, you, you don't spray your yard with Roundup. You know, you yeah. don't, you know, you buy organic fruits and vegetables. You, you, you have grass-fed meat. You don't rig out of plastic water bottles. You get a water filtration system for your home. You get an air filtration system for your home. You know, just just it's 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 not that hard. <laughs> you know, the roundup, you, all those things feel like yeah. Let's look farther into that. And the roundup is one I just recently looked into. And if you actually pull up a package insert or a product insert mm-hmm. and read what they state in there, it's scary. And I think that's something that we don't necessarily. It's just something you do, right? You go and you don't want weeds, so you spray roundup. But but to take the time and actually understand what that is. Well, the, the problem, and, and the problem, Jeff, is that the, the chemical companies have gotten away with murder 
quite literally, in my opinion, uh, in that, you know, they only have to tell you what the active ingredient is. And the active ingredient in Roundup is glyphosate. And glyphosate itself was, was designed as a metal descaling agent for metal pipes. <laughs> So it, it binds it binds metals and metals include things like magnesium and manganese and copper and iron things that we need in our body to help yeah. help, help support us. It will bind those in our gut and it'll also do things like uh, well never I'm getting aside the the point that I was trying to make initially is that the glyphosate itself is the only thing that they they listed as the active ingredient. Well, Dr. Seralini in uh, in France, he did a study. He, he and his group did a study on three pesticides, three herbicides, three fungicides, and they looked at the active ingredient by itself, and then the active ingredient plus the so-called inactive or inert ingredients. Well, and just to take this, just to take this to a very low level, again, we're trying to look at the holistic person, right? Mm-hmm. And how can we? not look at the holistic element of what's involved in a product. Exactly. Yeah. You can't because the, what he found was well while the the glyphosate by itself it was truly not as toxic as they as the manufacturer said when you mixed it with the so-called inactive ingredients it was suddenly 3000 times more toxic than the than, than the glyphosate by itself. Oh, so it's it's you know the, that's the it's the problem is, is in in environmental medicine or just in in toxicology there there is no just direct linear relationship mm-hmm. and then when you start putting one and more than one product together in the in the same thing you have you, you can have relationships that look U shape where the lower the dose and the higher the dose the more toxic they are and you know the medium doses aren't as toxic you can have things like well one one level starts very slow and has a very slow rise but you put two in there and all of a sudden you've got a you know an f f 27 jet you know climbing and, and, and accelerating at the same time is it's the amount of lead that would take to kill one in 100 mice, mix it with any amount of mercury, and you've now killed 100 out of 100 mice. So interesting to me <laughs> when you start thinking deeper, right? We're talking deeper healing and deeper thinking. And so we talked about the diet, emotion, environment. And then lastly, physical is, you know, what's already wrong with you? You know, you're a middle-aged woman. You're going through menopause. Um, you've got autoimmune thyroiditis, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you've got Crohn's disease, you've got ulcerative colitis, you've got, you know, things that are already increasing the demand on your system for, for stuff that's caused by inflammation because the demand on your system was too great to begin with. Find out what caused that increase in the demand, fix that, and it makes the management of this other stuff so much easier. And then the ER is elimination, get rid of the stuff you don't need and rebuild with the stuff that you do. So you have patients coming to you that have experienced allopathic medicine as what we've talked about earlier. And so we're really just treating symptoms, treating specific disease. And they sit across from you, maybe have some assumptions on what biologic integrative medicine providers, um, like what education level they have. So they might come in with these assumptions that you're not conventionally trained or um, they don't trust the system behind holistic medicine, alternative medicine, right? There's many different names we can put on this. What is your story? What got you to a deeper healing clinic? Um, You also mentioned writing prescriptions. So I assume that you do have a story that brought you up through the journey of Western medicine to a degree. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, um, I was a card carrying member of the Church of the Medical Orthodoxy for a lot of years. I went to Ohio State University, graduated school of College of Medicine, did a residency in family practice in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, started off with a family practice, but then it decided I like to eat. So I went to, I got grandfathered into ER. I got boarded in ER medicine and spent 22 years doing emergency room work. And snatching wow. people from the jaws of death. And, and it's like it was very rewarding, very fulfilling. But it was, you know, it's physically and emotionally very tiring. And uh, one day on the, on the way home, the uh, universe tapped me on the shoulder with a two by four upside the head. <laughs> and uh, I was in a car accident coming home from a night shift and blew out several discs in my neck and my back. 
but being the card carrying member of the Church of the Medical Orthodoxy, I went to the physiatrist and the neurosurgeon and had the trigger point injections and the epidurals and the long and short acting narcotics and the muscle relaxants and the anti inflammatories and the sleeping pills and, and, and the antidepressants and then eventually the pro vigil to be so I had enough energy because all this other stuff was bringing me down to at least function through the day. And I was absolutely miserable. And physical therapy wasn't working. Nothing was working. I was still miserable. They said, well, let's do a percutaneous disc decompression. I went, great. We all know that surgery works when medicine fails. And so I went through this very benign, very low-risk procedure, worked great for a week, and ended up with an infection in my disc and my spine that cost me six weeks of, of IV antibiotics. And by the time I was done with that, I was more miserable than when I had the accident. You know, what's so interesting, if I can just stop you there, is sure. that journey is traumatic to say the least. Even taking out the trauma side and just looking at the medicine and we're on mm -hmm. a podcast called Don't Take the Pill. So by all means, if you're listening right now, I don't want you to sit there and say, well, I'm taking a bunch of pills. This podcast isn't for me. No, this podcast is for you. If you listen to this journey, the goal is to say, how do we get you off of the medications you just listed? Exactly. And how do we help you find a deeper healing? And so, uh, yeah, continue on. What's your journey with exploring that? So, <laughs> so after I took all the pills and and uh, I, I uh, am not feeling any better and did the IV antibiotics, I had to run into a guy, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. I'd worked with him in the ER, and he had started an anti-aging practice in Delray Beach. I was in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And uh, he said, Mike, let me give you some IV vitamin C. And I literally, I leaned forward and I looked down and I said, Mark, I thought you were a doctor. And he said, I am. What have you got to lose? <laughs> At this so point. Went, At this point, what the hell? I rolled up my sleeve. And after the third infusion, I went out to my car and I went to open my car door and I went, that didn't hurt. And it was the first time in almost three years that I remembered what it was like not to be in constant pain. And mm -hmm. so while I was still pain free, I reached into my my wallet. I pulled out my Church of the Medical Orthodoxy card. I ripped it up. I threw it in the air and I went, I'm done. You know, I got to find out more. I got to learn what they didn't teach me in medical school. And that's what started me on the journey that led me to IV vitamin C and ACAM and chelation and, you know, stuff I would have five years before I would have laughed and scoffed at you. Yeah. My now wife was, was, was telling me at the time, says, why don't you take some, why don't you take some curcumin or some berber or some enzymes to help it? I looked at her and I went, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, and it's interesting that Western medicine and anything that's not Western medicine is considered, uh, like, why would I do that? Right. It's yeah. just trained in physician. It's trained in humans to not explore this other side of just, authentic health? How do we support the oxidative stress situation that's going on? Um, for you, I'm assuming you're saying that was vitamin C, right? That Yeah, for that, for that it was vitamin C. And, and he also used alpha-lipoic acid, yeah. uh, IV, and, and those that combo worked. And then I was able to do physical therapy. I, and not, actually, I, I went in uh, uh, Pilates, and that gave me the core strength to you know, support the mus back and muscles, and my pain went away. <laughs> it was like, oh, wow. You're conventionally trained as an MD, mm -hmm. worked in family medicine, transferred to the ER, and then you turned around, had a traumatic experience, went on medications, went through a couple procedures, some surgeries, vitamin C changed your life to the point where you said, hey, I got to do something different. I have a different calling. Mm -hmm. Is that when deeper healing came about? Well, that's when my journey towards deeper healing came about. And uh, I, I went and I joined ACAM and I learned, you know, about bioidentical hormone replacement and gut health and adrenal fatigue and, and how to do IV therapies. And I started a practice in Fort Lauderdale called Full Potential Healthcare. I wanted to bring people, you know, let them experience and realize their full potential. But there's about, there's about 20% of the people that no matter how well I balance their adrenals, no matter how well their hormones were working, no matter how much, you know, gut health we had going, they still weren't experiencing that, that full potential that I'd hoped for. And I was, I couldn't understand what it was I was missing. And that's when there was a, a little ad that came across in, in, uh, through the ACAM newsletter about we're offering this course in environmental medicine. It said, do your patients suffer with boom, 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 boom. And I went, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. They, said, they may have an environmental, environmental illness. And I went, What's that? <laughs> yeah. 
And so I, I took a course from Walter Crinion um, uh, for uh, training for physicians for environmental medicine. And it just opened my eyes. And that's really kind of when deeper healing was born, because I, I at least the seeds of it were born. Because then it was around those same times as when I was listening to Stephen Genoas and reading his papers and listening to Tom Levy. And, and it all started to, to coalesce in my mind about, you know, oxidative stress and inflammation and the role that environment, the environment is the one rock nobody bothers to look under. Mm -hmm. And just doing that. And that's what my focus has been on for the last, the last couple of years. And that's, that's really what I've been able to help even the people that have been to the, to, to the naturopaths and, and, and the functional medicine docs. And they just like, I'm still not better. I'm still not better. And I said, I know exactly how you're yeah. feeling. And we go through the survey about, you know, what are your chemical exposures have been? And are you chemically sensitive that, you know, that you can't walk down the soap aisle at the grocery store without getting a headache or nausea? That's yeah. it. That you've got a problem environmentally and we need to fix that. Is there a condition you're, I would, I would say passionate about? Treating, if there's a listener out there who is sitting with autoimmunity or just um, migraines, you name it, is there something where you're like... Well, remember just, you know, where, where I'm passionate about is, is if you, and, and this is, this is where, where my marketing person would kill me, but, <laughs> you know, that, that part where I said you don't pay attention to the diagnosis because that makes yeah. you feel better and it makes the doc feel better, but it doesn't understand why. The net of whether you're dealing with the autoimmune condition or the chronic, you know, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, whatever names you, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, whatever name you want to put on it, it's an imbalance in the immune system. Yeah. You know, your immune system is out of whack. Why is your immune system out of whack? It's not, the EBV virus is not, cause, is not the root cause of your problem with chronic fatigue. It's the failure of your immune system to keep surveillance active on that virus to keep it under, under control. Mm -hmm. Why is your immune system not working? And that comes back down to diet, emotion, environment, physical. You know, it's often a combination of those things. But the rock that I get passionate about is the environmental part because nobody's asking. Them. Nobody's asking about what kind of pans are you cooking with? What kind of mattress are you sleeping on? What kind of water are you drinking? You know, those things that, that are controllable and that I can help you fix by dumping your total body burden. That then allows the immune system to get rebound. I tell people all the time, you know, your boat is sinking. If your boat is sinking, in order for you to get back to shore, you've got to identify and fix the leak, and you've got to bail your boat. If you just bail the boat with a traditional allopathic model, you're gonna, your arms are going to get tired. You're going to sink anyway. Mm -hmm. You've got to find a leak. So if I'm passionate about something, it's about finding the damn leak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find, find and fix the leak. We can bail the boat later. I think it's a beautiful picture of the struggle. Mm-hmm. Right? Where's the leak? And sometimes, yeah. sometimes it seems that you're seven medications in with a pill box and you don't even know where to start. And so for um, a patient that's been through the allopathic model, American medicine, if I can just say what is considered traditional orthodox, if they're in that model, they go to the doctors and the onboarding is, hey, give me your social security number, give me your insurance card, let me bring you in, get your weight, your height, the doc will be in sit with you for 20 minutes and then write a prescription and you go home. Mm -hmm. Yep. What does the onboarding process look like in your practice? Well, of course you got to collect your demographic data, you know, and then so your, your, your identifications and all that stuff. But, you know, basically I ask for your insurance card, not, I don't, I don't bill insurance. That's entirely between you and the insurance company, but I use it to, if we can order some labs, oftentimes they get labs paid for by insurance. So, I, I will ask for your insurance card, but basically you're, you're, so in that way, it's very much like a traditional medical model. But from there, it's totally different because you get a, uh, you get a fairly long inventory looking at, looking, and it's divided diet, emotion, environment, mm -hmm. physical, and there are multiple questions in, in each of those areas that you fill out before you get here. And, and I want an explanation of what, you know, what, what is your experience with your illness? You know, when did it start? What's it feel like? I, I really don't want to know what you've been diagnosed with because to me it's irrelevant. It, it may help me guide me towards a, a pathway, but it's, it's, it's really irrelevant about what I'm going to do for you. It's such a non-conventional way of thinking through it. And I did want to speak to the insurance thing because that will catch people up a little bit, I believe, mm -hmm. to entering into a different model of medicine. And I myself go to a functional medicine doctor 
and I give my insurance card and then I get all the paperwork that I myself submit to my insurance and then they write me a check. So it is accessible for those of you listening saying like, I just don't want to deal with that headache. It's not only accessible, but it's worth it. Time is spent with, um, with my practitioner. At least I spend 40 minutes to an hour of talking Mm -hmm. about where we're at from just a well being space. What my blood work looks like. Is that something that you look into? Oh yeah. Oh oh, yeah. I mean, I still, I, I want to know what your, what your blood work's doing, but I, I, I'm, you know, most, you go to a, a traditional doctor now and, and they're going to do a CBC, you know, a blood count. They're going to look at your liver and kidney functions, your cholesterol level, and maybe a TSH for your thyroid. That doesn't even scratch the surface of what, you know, for, for possible. What I'm looking for when I do lab work is what are the indicators that some underlying issue is occurring? So I'll look at your ANA. I'll look at, at at your lymphocyte subset panel. I want to know what your complement levels are. I want to, you know, I want to know what your B12 and folate and vitamin D levels are doing. I want to know what your hormones are. And I don't want I mean just your thyroid. I mean, I want well with your thyroid. I want your TSH, your free T3, your free T4, your reverse T3, your thyroid antibodies at at the minimum. A full panel. A full panel. And I want, you know, when I'm looking at your hormones, I want an FSH, an LH, a free and total testosterone, an estrogen, a progesterone, a cortisol level, a, you know, a, 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 a parathyroid hormone level. I want I a growth hormone, IGF-1. I want to know what the hell's going on with your yeah. with your hormone system. Yeah. You know, well, as well as the inflammatory markers for your, you know, your HSCRP and your, and uh, your PLA, LPA, PLA2 and just things that will indicate that I don't care what your cholesterol level is. If these markers are high, you're at risk for a heart problem. And the cholesterol one is interesting. I know we, I had actually heard you speak to someone about this specific issue Mm -hmm. and it got me excited because I feel as if it represents the journey of so many people out there. So you go to your conventional doctor, he says, Hey, you have high cholesterol. I'm going to put you on a statin, right? Mm -hmm. But this statin could lead to some muscle cramps. So I'm going to write this prescription as well. And these two together sometimes cause some issues for your digestion. Uh, let me actually prescribe this medication as well. And before you know it, you walk out the door, you're on three medications. And you don't even know if your high cholesterol is something that is actually a problem to your holistic well-being as a, as a whole. Yeah. Is that something you see and then you draw blood work and then you address? Or is that something where you just say, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't need to be on any of these medications, right? Like where I bet you get these patients every day that come to you on a handful. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell, and I will, I will look at your lipid profile when I do your lab tests. And when it, when it comes up, I'll, I'll say, this is your cholesterol level. And you know what? This doesn't make a damn bit of difference, whether it's high or low. The important thing is what your inflammatory markers are, because it's, I know this for several reasons. One, if you think about it, 52% 52% of the people that fall over dead with a fatal heart attack every day do so with a stone cold normal cholesterol. That's on one end. On the other end, you have this, the, these people with familial hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia. When you draw blood and you spin it down, you separate the red cells from the serum. The serum should look nice and straw colored. I mean, these people's cholesterol are so high that straw colored stuff looks like cream. I mean, it's just so full of fat. Coronary arteries are clean as a whistle. Why are they, if cholesterol were the issue, why the guy with the normal cholesterol falling over dead? And why are the people with the high cholesterol walking around alive? The answer is because it has not a blessed thing to do <laughs> with cholesterol. It has everything to do with inflammation. And I, I know the drug companies know this because in 1992 or 93, I had a guy from Eli Lilly walk into my ER at Imperial Point Medical Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and tried to tell me that the next heart attack patient I had had to get, I had to start them on their, on their statin drug as soon as they walked in the door. And I went, why in God's holy name am I worried about their cholesterol when they're having a heart attack? And he says, because it doesn't work by lowering cholesterol, it works through an anti-inflammatory action like aspirin. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I just kind of filed that. And I kind of went, okay, now I'm going, those morons have been selling us a bill of goods for their $9 billion a year profit ever since. Because I can achieve that anti-inflammatory effect with things like vitamin C and vitamin E uh, and and and, and, and fish oil and not cause the complications of statin drugs like increasing your risk for death from a hemorrhagic stroke or increasing your risk of death from cancer or increasing your risk of death from congestive heart failure because Mm -hmm. of the the nutrients that the statin drugs deplete in your body. 
Hmm. Sorry, I get I get excited. No, I love that rant. <laughs> and basically, I mean, basically, there is hope for you as a listener if you are on three different drugs that are yeah. a result of one drug, right? Because yeah. again, we're treating symptoms. Drugs can create symptoms. So then you, what do you do? You pile on another drug. Treat the cause. <laughs> ask the que- Take the time to ask the question, why is this symptom happening? What is behind this complex? Don't be satisfied with giving it a name and writing a prescription. When we're looking at deeper healing, sometimes people will go to a practitioner and they'll get them only so far, right? Mm -hmm. But you're saying advocate when you go to these practitioners, advocate for the environmental side. Ask good questions to your doctor about the environmental side. What is coming in that could be a threat to the, the body creating oxidative stress? And when that's recognized and when the diagnosis, and I'm putting that in air quotes because really we're just trying to find the inflammation or the area that's creating the, the issue. Oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. Then we can use um, ultraviolet blood irradi- irradiation or we can use... Ozone, live O2, juvent, sauna. Uh, just, it just, you know, there, there's, there is a bottom line uh, to um, any environmental toxin or toxicant. And, and how it affects our body. And I assume with each human having a different imprint, everyone is different. There is no direct approach that you have to take for every single person, right? It probably varies. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't have a lot of tools in my toolbox, but I use each one at different, in different ways at different times for any, for any given patient. You know, so basically my, my, my tools are oxygen ultraviolet light, IV therapies. And, you know, the big part is identifying the source of the problem and, and, and going to the source. So if it's a, you know, if you're sitting around eating, uh, you know, standard American diet, sad diet. Um, standard American you know, diet, <laughs> sad diet. I have never heard of that before. Yeah. <laughs> um, then you're not going to, you know, you're going to have oxidative stress just, and just fixing that may be sufficient in the short run. But well, and sorry to cut you off there, but to go back to the very beginning of our conversation, you talked about nutrients, right? And so, mm-hmm, if you're eating the mm-hmm. sad diet, you're not getting nutrient dense food that can fight the oxidative stress and precisely balance yeah. out the yeah. yep the toxins and the issues that are creating precisely. So, it, you know, diet is necessary but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Knowing how to deal with emotional stress is necessary but not sufficient. Identifying and avoiding the toxicants that are causing you a problem are necessary but not sufficient. Rebalancing your hormones, fixing your gut, you know, getting rid of the toxins is necessary but not sufficient. It becomes sufficient when you do all these things all the time. So deeper healing is not just helping me figure out what's wrong with you, but it's also something that you can take and use as a, a, as a paradigm for the rest of your life. And how do I stay healthy? You know, I want to pull you out of the hole, dust you off and pat you on the head and say, go have a good life. You know, <laughs> yeah, I don't want you as a permanent patient. <laughs> I want to get you healthy and out of here. Go and go enjoy life. Don't spend time spending time with me. Go out there and enjoy life. Yeah, I loved that part of your wellness is our mission. And that is something that is all over your website. And we mm-hmm. will attach your website into the show notes. Mm-hmm. But your wellness is our mission. It's not to maintain you as a patient every couple of weeks. No, we don't want to see you. We want to get you well and send you on your way. (laughs) And so on that note, you've listed a couple of things, but what are three things that just come to the top of your head that someone listening right now can change? Clean up your diet. Quit drinking out of plastic water bottles. Get rid of the, you know, any cookware that's not ceramic, cast iron or or, uh, stainless, get rid of. I mean, there's lots of things. You uh, clean air, clean food, clean water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do those three things, and 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 your your life can take a definite turn for the better. Doctor Bauer Schmidt, I just appreciate your wisdom, your experience, and your time today. It was, it's just enlightening hearing everyone has a different approach to a degree, and yours comes grounded in such a desire to partner and heal. And I really want to. Talk to the listener out there to find someone like Dr. Bauer Schmidt, but also recognize that you can advocate for yourself in. Oh, yeah. Even going to uh, even your current doctor, let's say you have an appointment tomorrow, start partnering. Stop just blindly submitting and trusting. Start asking good questions about the environment, um, asking good questions about your diet. And 
Yeah. Uh, also, I just want to say, email us for any information, any questions. We're at don't take the pill at gmail.com and we can give you more information on Dr. Bauer Schmidt as well. Uh, anything, any final words that you would like to put out there? Well, if, if you talk to your doctor about environmental medicine and he kind of goes, oh, the body can detox, A, find another doctor. <laughs> and, and you can go, there's a National Acad or National Association of Environmental Medicine, NAEM.com, it list practitioners. And also, I believe the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, which is AAEMonline.com. Uh, I believe they also have a list of environmental medicine docs, or at least members of the organization that ought to have at least a working knowledge of of, of environmental medicine. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has just been such a joy. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, have a great day. <laughs> My pleasure. You too. Bye.